This talk is gonna be uh, an unscientific survey of Python interpreters, and I know I'm in a room of at least some actual scientists, so I really do mean it is unscientific. Um, if you wanna follow along, that bit.ly link will get you to a gist on GitHub of uh, the Jupyter Notebook that this is all written in. Uh, I'm actually using Rise uh, to do this, so this is all live off of the notebook. Um, you can use the Azure ML Studio uh, if you want to actually download the IPython notebook and load it up and directly play with something. Uh, I was using uh, mbviewer.jupyter.org when I gave this talk Saturday uh, in Toronto at PyCon Canada, but I was getting a 502 earlier today, so you can just grab the gist manually and do whatever you want to view the notebook. As I said, though, uh, free hosting, uh, viewing if you want on Azure Studio. Uh, with that out of the way, if my keyboard wants to suddenly not work, that's not good. There we go, okay. Uh, so just a quick thing about me. Uh, my name is Brett Cannon. I've been a core developer since 2003, so about 12 years now. Um, blog, Google+, Twitter, GitHub, blah, blah, blah. Um, basically, just Google my name, you'll find me. Um, Quick thanks to Microsoft, who I work for, uh, specifically the Python team, and yes, there is a Python team at Microsoft, uh, and the data analytics group in Azure um, for sending me out here. We're hiring. Uh, uh, our team at pythonjobs.microsoft.com. Uh, in general, you can just go to careers.microsoft.com. I've now done what I, my contextual duty, so we'll actually start talking. Uh, so what is this about? So this is about interpreters that actually implement Python. Uh, I have a certain requirement to have a interpreter considered uh, to be implementing Python to be discussed here. Uh, so first thing, it has to implement a version of Python that I consider modern. Uh, that's 2.7, obviously. Or 3.3 at a minimum, which unfortunately cuts out PyPy3, but based on an informal survey on Twitter, people all said they wanted at least 3.3, so, and PyPy3 is only at 3.2 at the moment. Uh, I also said it had to run most of the Grand Unified Benchmark Suite, which you can find at uh, hg.python.org slash benchmarks. Uh, it's actually the Unladian Swallow benchmarks basically cleaned up to work on Python 3 and to work across all these interpreters. Uh, I also said it had to work on at least OS 10 or Linux or Windows, basically a chance everyone in this room had one of these OSs, so I don't know of any interpreters that run on some marginalized OS, but I decided that had to at least be some form of a requirement. So, uh, I'm gonna go through a quick history of the interpreters of Python, because it's surprisingly rich, and I think it's something people kind of overlook, that there's actually a good tradition in this um, community to actually love this language enough that they want to actually re-implement the bloody thing, because it's not easy, but people want to do it, and they do it a lot, and I think it should be recognized. So if you don't know, Guido actually started creating Python in December of 1989 uh, while working at CWI in the Netherlands uh, to develop a scripting language for the Amoeba distributed operating system. And uh, it was basically an internal thing at CWI until uh, 1991 when he released version 0.9.0 .0 on alt sources back when Usenet was a thing. Uh, and then three years later, we got CPython 1.0. Obviously not the 18 month release cycle we have now, but hey, at least you got there. But uh, one, thing, uh, one thing to notice though is, I mean, five years ago from nothing to one back then, and open source was still kind of not a huge thing, and not too bad. Um, and then in 1997, uh, Jim Huguenin released JPython, uh, the first alternative implementation of Python. So if you notice, we went from December of 89, so basically 1990, to 97, to having an alternative implementation of the language, which I think is honestly really fast, if you really think about it. I mean, it's seven years. To, for, someone, for the popularity of Python to get to a, enough of a point for someone to be crazy enough to go, I like this enough, I'm just gonna reimplement it just because I want to. <laughs> and Jim's name will be seen again in this, another slide, and you'll realize truly how nuts Jim is, but. Um, anyway, 1997, seven years. I think that's actually surprisingly fast and a real testament to how much we all love language. Um, subsequently, one year later in 98, Christian Chismer developed Stackless, uh, version 1.0. In case you don't know about Stackless, it does what it sounds like. It takes the stack out of CPython, uh, which you really care about when you need to do some large um, scaling in terms of lots of um, simultaneously running calculations and such. 
um, G event kind of builds off this kind of idea. It's that kind of parallelization. Um, if you know of the game EVE Online from CPP Games in uh, Iceland, they actually run their entire server uh, for that game in Stackless. Um, one year after that, uh, Barry Warsaw renamed G -Py J Python to Jython, as we now know it by, and had the 2.0 release. They obviously released new versions faster than Guido did back, since that was only two years instead of this uh, four to go to version one for them, but good for them. Uh, hey, we've all, we all release faster now. Um, two, two years later, after, uh, in 2001, uh, the Parrot April Fool's joke occurred. For those of you who don't know, uh, that April Fool's, Guido and Larry Wall of Python, uh, Python of Perl released a um, April Fool's joke creating a new language called Parrot that was going to be the marriage of Perl and Python. And it was actually um, fairly elaborate to the point that O'Reilly actually did an interview with them and published it on O'Reilly.com. So this is not one, this was not a small little April Fool's joke. Uh, it was also kind of the start of a tradition of doing occasional April Fool's jokes uh, in Python. Um, if you ever, from future import, um, Fluffle or some other things, you'll know some of the previous April Fool's jokes that we've done. Uh, look in the peps, you'll find a couple. 401, for instance, for April 1st, anyway. Just Google around, you'll get a couple chuckles. Um, so that was 2001. 2003, Armin Riga released Psycho 1.0, which is probably the first JIT ever done for Python. Um, it was a real deep hack into C Python and very specific to numerics, but at least proved that there was a reasonable chance that this would make sense to add a JIT. Um, one year later after that, though, uh, Armin and people on the Python um, Germany, uh, Python-DE mailing list, started to chat and go, hey, you know what? We should implement Python in Python. And they went, sure, why not? <laughs> and that's how we ended up with PyPy. Seriously, it was literally just people talking on a mailing list and just going, why don't we just do this? Why not? Um, obviously, it ended up subsuming parts of Stackless and all of Psycho. And um, as we all know it, it's actually one of the fastest implementations of Python at this point, which no one thought of at all way back then, because that was back when they were like 30 times slower, because it was literally Python and Python. Um, 2004 was also the year Dan Sigalski got a pie to the face. Um, Dan was the creator of the Parrot VM, which was actually named after the 2001 April Fool's joke, uh, and was going to be the official VM for Perl 6, whenever Perl 6 happens. Um, and basically, he made a bet with Guido that Parrot could run Python faster than C Python. Uh, Dan actually never finished, because Dan didn't realize how dynamic Python is, and thus how crazy everyone else is for implementing Python other than C Python. Um, Guido actually didn't want to do it, but um, there was a donation to charity if he did it, so Guido did stick a pie in Dan's face. There are photos online if you want to find out. Um, 2006, uh, Jim Huguenin, who created Python, uh, created Iron Python, and released that at PyCon. Uh, this was Jim trying to prove a point. Basically, people had said .NET was not going to be good for dynamic, dynamic programming languages, so Jim decided, all right, I'll, I'll prove that. I'll try to implement Python and show them where they're really screwing up. Uh, it turned out they weren't, and Jim actually did it, and actually worked out reasonably well. Uh, this is actually what led to the dynamic language runtime on .NET, and Jim actually going to work for Microsoft for a few years. Uh, 2008 was Only and Swallow. That was Google's project uh, by a couple core devs there. Uh, they tried to basically use the LLVM JIT to speed up Python. Uh, unfortunately, the LLVM JIT was very buggy back then, and they spent most of their time fixing bugs in LLVM than actually trying to speed up Python. Uh, but we did get our benchmark suite from them, and so not, it wasn't a complete waste of time. Uh, 2013, um, the MicroPython Kickstarter campaign launched, um, which is probably the first alternative partial Python 3 implementation of Python 3. Um, it's not a full implementation because it is designed to run on um, little microboards, but it is the first alternative, to, at least to some extent, of Python 3. Excuse me. Uh, 2014, things heated up yet again in the interpreter space. Uh, Piston from Dropbox was announced at PyCon. I'll talk, I have a slide about that later. Uh, PyPy 3 had its first stable release, and that was the first alternative implementation of Python 3. 
And then just this year, uh, Pigeon, which I have a slide on later, uh, was announced at Pi Day at Seattle. Uh, Russell Keith McGee, just this past September at Vancouver Python Day, announced VLC, and I'll discuss that. Um, and then the last big announcement was that the uh, BBC Microbits, if any of you have seen, is this little uh, controller board that's going to be given to every uh, seventh grader in the UK, is going to be running Python thanks to MicroPython. So pretty soon there are going to be more Python 3 programmers thanks to the UK than there probably are anywhere else, and we'll outnumber Python 2 programmers. So if you don't switch to Python 3, your jobs will be in trouble once those kids graduate. <laughs> Got to pitch Python 3 somehow, right? OK, so the interpreters. There's about four of them that meet my criteria that I laid out at the beginning. There's so obviously CPython. It's implemented in C. Big shock. We all know that. Uh, it does obviously work with C extensions. Um, it is available on all the major operating systems. Um, and it's obviously the most compatible because people basically implicitly decide that if it works on CPython, it's got to be right, uh, much to the dismay of PyPy people. Uh, we are willing to fix things that are badly defined, so it's not totally true. Um, Anyway, uh, there's also Jython, which is implemented in Java and will run anywhere JDK 7 well. So that's pretty much all the major operating systems. Uh, there's partial C extensible uh, extension compatibility thanks to a project called J, called Jai and I. Uh, it's still being actively developed, so I don't know how quite far they are in terms of compatibility, but it is being worked on. It is the second oldest, as you saw, um, since 97. And it currently supports Python 2.7. Uh, there's obviously PyPy, uh, which is written in what's called RPython, a, a subset of Python itself, which basically can be uh, have type reference run on it. Uh, it supports C extensions through actually three possible ways. CFFI is the newest one. Uh, C types, if you want to go that route. Uh, I advise you don't. Um, and CPPYY, which comes out of CERN, although the web page uh, actually basically is a 404. So I don't know how active it's being developed. But PyPy lists it. Um, it is historically the fastest Python interpreter, and I'll have numbers to show later where you can make that decision whether that's still true or not. Mystery. How did he word that? Um, it does work on Linux, OS X, and Windows, and obviously uh, currently supports 2.7 and 3.2. Uh, and I should mention, if you didn't hear, PyPy did release version 4 uh, just last week or the week before. So they did have a very big new release recently. Uh, and then lastly is Iron Python implemented in C Sharp. Uh, they use a project called Ironclad that came out of Revolver Systems when they were doing their uh, custom spreadsheet. And that'll work on any platform with .NET 3.5 or higher, which is pretty much everyone thanks to Mono and also .NET being open sourced. Uh, and it supports Python 2.7. So what's coming down the pipeline if people continue to get money and have the time and inclination to continue to work on those projects that have been announced? Uh, one project is Pigeon. I should just uh, give a disclaimer. I work on this part time myself um, at Microsoft. It's basically a perfect concept to add a JIT to C Python. So the idea is PyPy has shown that JITs are great for Python, but obviously they have a slight compatibility problem with C extension modules if you don't use CFFI. Uh, so Dino uh, Vland, who used to work on the Iron Python project, basically after this past PyCon in April decided oh, why not? Let's just see if we can add the .NET JIT to C Python and get Python 3 running faster with its own JIT. So this is a proof of concept that he started, uh, where we're going to hopefully show that we can actually speed things up with a JIT and then push patches up into C Python so that you can basically, with either a flag on the command line or literally just an import, get a JIT activated for your Python code and have it just work. Uh, and I'll have numbers on this on whether where we are with this so far. Uh, Piston, which I mentioned earlier, was announced in 2014 at the Language Summit at PyCon. Uh, this is being sponsored by Dropbox and being actively developed. Um, they're using LLVM for their JIT, much like Elaine and Swallow, but the difference is uh, about seven years of bug fixes. So they're actually showing, um, for their own benchmarks, a 25% speed up already for CPython, uh, although they are not fully compliant yet in terms of compatibility. Um, but they are getting there, it seems like, and um, they, there's definitely promise. It is only targeted towards Ubuntu and 2.7, though, because it is specific for Dropbox's servers. Um, I think they're open, though, to opening it to other platforms. Uh, and then last, uh, there's also VOC, which I mentioned was announced in Vancouver just this past September. Uh, basically, uh, Russell Keith McGee of Django wants uh, Python on mobile you ha on iOS. You have Objective-C, which is compatible with C, so that's taking her 
taken care of by CPython, but that does not deal with the Java of Android. So um, the, the way I've said it, and people seem to like it, uh, it being said is, and uh, he's trying to take it from Java, Java, Java on Android to py um, Python, Python, Android, uh, Python, Python, Java, by basically transpiling Python into Java. So this is not like Jython where it's a interpreter implemented in Java, and so there's actually an, uh, an eval loop. He's actually literally trying to translate Python code to Java code so you can compile straight to dot uh, class files to then put onto an Android device. Uh, it's obviously really new because he just announced it in September, uh, but he's hoping to basically get Python 3 onto Android. Uh, and lastly, uh, a quick mention of Skython, which was announced at this past Language Summit. Um, it's apparently a from scratch C implementation of Python with no GIL uh, in, for Python 3. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was announced then and we were told it was going to be open sourced in about a week or so, and we've not heard anything since. So I have no clue where it's at, but it was, we at least know somewhere in someone's code repo there exists a non-GIL version of, C Py of Python written from scratch for Python 3 that we think works, at least we've been told. Okay. Um, now there might be various reasons why you can't change your interpreter. Uh, so there are other ways to speed up, but not really new to this crowd. There's always Cython because that'll compile straight to C and in certain instances that can be faster when you add the type um, annotations that they use. Um, it's also another way to get compatibility, uh, or not compatibility, be able to access uh, C code when you have to write the, the hot part of your inner loops or actually access a C library. Uh, there's always Numba from Continuum. Uh, the great thing about Numba is it's literally just a decorator, so just tack it onto something that's running a little slow. And if it's numeric code, it should just run faster. Uh, so it's dirt cheap to try. So I would definitely recommend if you're doing numerics to profile your code, figure out who's running slow, tack on the decorator and just see what happens. And then obviously, lastly, there's CFFI from the PyPy team. Uh, it's a quick way to uh, wrap C code uh, that will work with both C, Python, and PyPy. And honestly, it's easier than hand wrapping uh, C code that you might need to wrap. Whether you're doing, once again, for uh, speed or you're having to interface with some um, other chunk of C code. Now, let's look at some pretty plots. Um, so, as I said, this is unscientific. Uh, everything you're about to look at uh, was used using, benchmarked on this little machine right here, uh, using the Grand Unified Benchmarks uh, suite from Python. Um, I tried to use a 64-bit every uh, interpreter when I could, which basically means a 32-bit one on, for PyPy, because they don't have a 64-bit Windows, and everyone else is 64-bit. Um, now, the key thing to read on these graphs, uh, on these charts is everything is relative to CPython 2.7.10, and it's a measurement of how long the benchmark took compared to how long it took on CPython 2.7. So if something is 1.0, it means it took exactly the same amount of time as it took CPython 2.7 to run. If it's 2, it means it took twice as long as CPython 2.7 to run. And if it's 0.5, it took half as much. So smaller is better is the key thing. And 1.0 means it's a tie. Claire? OK, cool. So uh, these are all the benchmarks. I'm just going to scroll through them. I don't really expect you to read them. It's mainly just to point out that there are things here, such as running two to three over itself. There's um, checking how fast it takes to do a call. Uh, Chameleon is uh, templating. Chaos is numbers. Django is templating. Uh, you will quickly learn that the element tree uh, benchmarks are evil and horrible for everyone except for CPython 2.7. It's really shocking. Uh, I actually have a to-do now to actually verify that something's not funky going on. Um, there's pickling, there's float work, uh, there's some logging, which is mostly string, there's JSON loading and dumping, which is more strings, uh, and queens, pathlib, pickling. Uh, basically, there's a mix, there's a mismatch of stuff here. So, let's look at all this in one unreadable plot, because there's no way in hell you can make out what the hell this says. But it's pretty. Uh, the key thing is to point out that a lot of people, lot, most of this stuff is really, really low and not completely crazy. And there's about three or four benchmarks that are just insane. Uh, so if you can't read that, that's 60. So that's about 60 times slower than CPython 2.7. Um, and as you'll find out, basically, that is E-tree parse. E-tree parse, as I said, E-tree is 
element tree is just horrible. It is a nasty, nasty benchmark. But basically, Matt Paul led made that cheap to do, and I thought it was pretty, so I did it. Uh, but I'm going to talk about all the interpreters individually, so you'll actually get a much better breakdown. Uh, so Jython had some compatibility problems. So this is running um, without uh, Chameleon V2, uh, Pathlib, Tornado, and Unpack Sequence. Basically, um, Pathlib was a lacking of Win version on the Sys module, for instance. Um, Unpack Sequence basically had too many method calls, if I remember correctly. Um, these are little compatibility problems that I'm sure if a bug was filed, uh, Jython would fix. Um, I should mention, I did not run the startup benchmarks against anyone, because basically, if your name is not CPython, it's slow as hell. Um, which is, I mean, which is fair. It's hard to get that fast. Uh, I should mention, though, PyPy4 uh, explicitly worked on speeding up startup for PyPy. So things have improved for them. I just purposely didn't benchmark it, because without that flag, things take one to two hours longer to benchmark. And I only have so much time. Um, so as I pointed out earlier, Drython had two really bad benchmarks. Um, so the really, really tall one is eTree parse, and the what looks small but is actually still large because it's more than 15 times slower is eTree Arctic parse. Um, I, as I said, I have a to-do on my list now to find out what the heck's going on with that benchmark because I'm shocked that they're that horrible. And they're not horrible at the other eTree uh, e benchmarks. But because that skews the data so high that you can't really read the um, charts, uh, I chopped it off at two times. So that's two times slower than CPython. And that's what that black line is. That's exactly marginal, or meeting uh, the speed of CPython 2.7 in terms of time. Uh, so as you can see, um, it's a mix. I mean, some things do go past two, obviously, but some things are actually faster. Uh, anything missing is basically not run because of compatibility issues. But I mean, it's not a complete blowout, which I think is basically impressive when you consider you're implementing a highly, highly dynamic programming language in a not highly, highly dynamic language at all, uh, that being Java. So I still, I think it's fairly impressive that they get these numbers as is. So um, another way to look at this is to um, do a box plot with um, a scatter plot on top. So. For those of you, does, it, does anyone here not know how to read a box plot? Okay, that's fine. Um, so basically the way a box plot works is um, it splits everything up into quartiles, so 25%. So that line is the median, so that's exactly halfway if you um, sorted the performance of all the benchmarks. That's benchmarks that are um, the 25% that are slower, 25% that are faster. That's the 25 fastest percent faster, and, the, and then you know, unfortunately can't see it because the last quartile of the 25% 25, 25 most slowest benchmarks goes off the 2.0 uh, cutoff I have. But as you can see, it's, it's just more or less clustered around um, 1.0. It's a little top heavy, but it's not crazy. And the 50% right around the median is all at least on the screen. Um, so I, once again, I think that's still fairly impressive for implementing Python in Java. Um, now, Iron Python, you'll notice, has a little bit more compatibility problem um, in different ways, like Django can't run here versus um, Chameleon, which couldn't run on Jython. Um, I should mention Tornado is apparently a really nasty program in terms of the way it really futzes with sockets. So don't be shocked that it's not compatible, because apparently if you don't use um, POSIX sockets directly, there's like no chance you can run it. Um, and then uh, eTree Outer Parse didn't run just because they literally don't implement. Um, Elementary to utter parse. Um, but overall, it's mainly compatible. Now, there is eTree parse again. It's just evil. Um, I don't know what it is about that benchmark. But that's only, real, as you can see, the really, really nasty outlier in all this. And if you trunc uh, truncate down to two, there's some that go past. I think it's less than Jyth uh, Jython in terms of overall worse than two. Um, the benchmarks, once again, some are better. Some are roughly about the same. Um, the ones that are missing, once again, um, were dropped for compatibility. But still, I, I, just like Jython, I still think it's fairly impressive that the benchmarks are both top and bottom compared to CPython 2.7. Uh, if you look at the bar chart, uh, as you can see, the whole uh, benchmark suite does, uh, sans outliers, does fit on the screen. So you, the top 25% uh, quartile 
does not go past two, point, uh, two times. Um, the fastest doesn't seem to go quite as low as Jython, but the median is a bit closer to 1.0, and the spread's, uh, to my mind, a little bit uh, looser and spread out a little bit more compared to Jython. But it does seem to have a little bit more below 1.0 than Jython did. Um, now, PyPy4, which is brand new, uh, no compatibility problems because the PyPy team works very hard on that. Um, fairly recent, and you would expect it to be the fastest. And it basically is. <laughs> uh, you'll notice there is one really bad performer, and that's for some reason Pickle Dict. I don't know why. Um, and the, one, the one next to it is Pickle List, and then um, Pi Digits, of all things. But it's 5 versus 40 and 60. Um, so nowhere near as high up as Python and Iron Python. And as you can see, there are some ones that you can barely measure. <laughs> I mean, there's a, obviously a, there's a handful that are definitely above two, uh, two times, but the vast majority are way below 50% faster than CPython 2.7. So PyPy definitely has earned its reputation as the fastest implementation of Python. And then the really obvious thing is when you look at the box plot, I mean, the whole 50%, 25% faster or slower than the median is completely below the 1.0 um, level for matching CPython 2.7 performance. I mean, you can just look at that and just obviously know that PyPy is just faster, period. Uh, now, out of interest, because I gave a talk at um, PyCon 20, 13 comparing uh, Python 2 to Python 3 and why you should switch, and I included benchmark numbers. I decided to run it again and see what does Python 3.5 do compared to 2.7, because I still have people telling me 2.7 is slower than 3.5. Sorry, I should reverse that. People tell me 3.5 is slower than 2.7. And at that uh, time, I did the talk and I said, look, it basically works out to be the same, and it still does. Uh, some things are faster, some things are slower. One thing I'll point out is that is not an error. Uh, telco, it really is that much faster. Uh, that is thanks to the decimal module being re-implemented in C. You can get that on PyPI, though. Um, but obviously, I ran this off stock installs, so um, telco completely trounces uh, C Python 2.7. But as you can see, it's more or less equivalent. There's, um, as I said, eTree IDER parse on this one's slower by over two. But it's pretty consistent, either a little above or actually decently below. If you turn crazy, you get a zoom in. It's not that much different, obviously. Um, but there's no real like consistently faster or slower, honestly. So I think it's pretty consistent. And if you look at the box plot, it's extremely tight around 1.0. I mean, you can barely make out the median line above 1. And it clusters really tightly. And the whole uh, box plot it fits between 0.5 and 1.5. Sans outliers, obviously. Um, now, as an experiment, I decided to try compiling CPython 3.5 with profile guide optimizations, or you might know it as Pogo, uh, using the test tweets to try to optimize the binary to run as fast as possible. And basically, it looks exactly like the previous uh, chart uh, for normal CPython 3.5, but all the bars pushed down slightly. Uh, so if you notice, um, all the benchmarks are no worse than uh, two times slower than 2.7, um, unlike the previous set of slides. And the box plot is even tighter, except this time the median is actually completely below 1.0. So Pogo, um, Pogo actually obviously helps actually make Python faster. Uh, and then based on time, I've got not much. So I'm going to skip the aside. Uh, but basically, there um, is only f six benchmarks where it's actually a hindrance for Pogo versus not. And the overall differences are fairly minuscule for most of them. So I'm going to try to convince Steve Dower to compile uh, Python, at least on Windows, with uh, Pogo turned on. Wish me luck. Um, and then I'm going to quickly uh, talk about Pigeon. Uh, this is the project that I work on part time that adds um, a JIT interpreter to CPython. Um, Unfortunately, there was a bug just before I started to do these benchmarks, so that's why 2 to 3 and Chameleon don't run. Um, I don't know why Tornado hangs, but it does. 
And that's the reason for the incompatibility. Otherwise, it's completely compatible because if it can't JIT something, it bails out and it continues to run under the eval loop for CPython. So there's zero compatibility problems if we didn't have bugs. Uh, what can you do? Uh, so if you notice, if you look at this, it's actually fairly similar to CPython 3.5, which Dino and I are actually fairly happy with because it shows that at least blindly adding a JIT with like no optimizations. It's almost a one-to-one -one translation of take this Python bytecode and somehow make it have an equivalent .NET bytecode, and it isn't worse, right? So that's not doing anything fancy. We're like, oh, no, now we have integer uh, bytecodes. We can actually start doing like integer and float and all this stuff with real low-level calculations and get the performance out of that. So I'm actually happy with this chart. If you zoom in, as I said, it more or less is pretty consistent. Some things are a little faster. Some things are somewhat slower. Um, but it's a mixed bag, but nothing completely like, oh my god, it's so slow, what the hell are we wasting our time with? Um, and the box plot looks somewhat similar to um, CPython itself. Uh, the top is a little worse, but um, everything's shifted a little higher, but it's not a complete blowout. Now to give a quick overview, um, here are all the box plots side by side. So it goes CPython, CPython with Pogo, Iron Python, Jython, PyPy, and then Pigeon. So nothing completely crazy. Everyone does, I think, a fairly admirable job. Uh, Python 3, no faster, no slower. Pogo obviously makes everything faster. Uh, Iron Python and Jython do an admirable job considering. PyPy is the fastest by far, and Pigeon does not make me want to stop working on it. <laughs> Uh, now, to give a more concrete view, uh, if you take the geometric mean over all the benchmarks, um, this is the chart you get. So once again, C Python, Python with C Python three with Pogo, Iron Python, Jython, PyPy, and Pigeon, uh, which also made me very happy because Pigeon is still, as a geometric mean average, faster than C Python two point seven. So it continues to make me not want to stop working on it. Um, C Python three point five, though, I found fairly interesting, is actually below one point zero. Uh, so for those of you who say 2.7 is faster overall, I don't believe you anymore. Um, obviously, it depends on your workload, but I'm no longer taking it too seriously when people say it's slower, it's slower. I'm obviously biased, though, so what can you do? Um, so just to wrap up, we got a lot of options, which is fantastic. This community is fantastic and seems to love the language enough that they actually like to re-implement the whole bloody thing, um, which is great because it gives us lots of options for your needs. Um, and considering how dynamic, dynamic the language is, I'm really impressed that the performance is as close as it is for all of the interpreters. And if any of this is interesting you at all and you want to help some of these people do better, they're all open source. They all take contributions. And that's it. Any questions? Oh, and thank you Sane, for saying to the very end. Sure. Uh, what run to run for a given for a given test? Like how consistent is it? Is it always fast, always slow? It's very consistent. Um, it can shift maybe a couple percent, like one or I, I think I've never seen more than a three percent shift between runs, but it's not like Suddenly, you're really fast, and suddenly you're really slow. It's it, the consistency is really good. This is why all the benchmarks are relative to another interpreter, um, and why we use it. Because the only while I was doing it to just say, are we doing better than we were previously? And that um, reliability of the comparison makes sure that if for some reason my the the benchmark machine was actually slower that day for who knows what was running in the background, both interpreters get screwed over, so no one loses out. And that's why I didn't show absolute performance numbers because. It just doesn't really pan out. Yeah, it's more about who's faster overall. Okay, so another one. Yeah. Uh, they're not compatible enough yet. So they have gotten far enough to run their benchmarks, but for instance, they haven't implemented um, the format built in. Like they have, they're still falling short enough that, like, just earlier this. Like, uh, I think in April or May, they announced that they were compatible enough to run their own, um, their own little scripts in their, in their checkout. So they're getting there. And they can obviously run some things. But they, if you look at their like, issues, it's like, implement this, implement that. It's just they're not quite there yet. 
give them a year and they'll probably be there. This is my suspicion. Because they're also pulling a lot of code directly out of CPython because they've decided to somewhat take the approach that Pigeon is in a way of let's add a JIT on top of CPython almost. So it's allowing them to really accelerate their development. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, well, so the, so the deal with PyPy is it kind of depends on the project you look at. So PyPy has the NumPy Pi project where they're more or less, from my understanding, re-implementing NumPy in RPython. Um, but for instance, I think part of the reason that project took so long, it, it led to the CFFI project. So for instance, if any of these libraries decided to Use Cython. I believe Cython supports PyPy, so Scikit-Learn, I believe, is fine. Um, but if you use something like um, SciPy itself or whatever, if they use CFFI, they'd instantly get both CPython and PyPy support. But once again, that requires the project to actually do that kind of switch, which obviously can take a bit of effort. Yeah. But it, I mean, the other hope is I think if um, Jython and RPython pick up CFFI, which they have mentioned they are seriously thinking about, you would suddenly get all the interpreters to work with the C extensions, which would be fantastic. Uh, but that hasn't materialized yet. That I don't know. It's possible someone's done it. Anyone else? Uh, I recently heard of the Pi project. Oh, Trends project? Yeah. Oh, you just, just, what do I know about it? Uh, so, so Trent Nelson, uh, for those of you who don't know, developed a project called PyParallel, which basically is a fork of CPython where he tried to introduce uh, parallelism by kind of ignoring the gil, more or less. Uh, it runs only on Windows, and he gets really good performance numbers, but like he, it, it's, it's kind of like freezes ref counts. Um, the deal is much like stackless, um, it kind of requires you to use certain built-ins in order to get the parallelism, because you kind of have to say, this is parallel and okay, go run it this way. And none of the benchmarks are structured that way. So there's no like inherent, it'll automatically run faster. You have to actually decide to use the performance of it to get it. So it's not implicit like a JIT, it's more explicit like this, or the software transactional memory stuff that the PyPy team's doing, that kind of thing. Uh, but I haven't heard anything since Language Summit, but Trent seems to like to muck with it, so I think it's always under development somehow. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you think there's a relative chance that we get rid of the two language issue at any point? Two language? You what, Python 2 and Python 3? No, I mean, writing everything in C and then using Python to interface with C. Uh, pfft, I mean, that's completely up to you guys. I would be totally happy if the world just ran in Python, but you guys have to be willing to give up the C code first, because I don't think you're suggesting you give up Python for C, because no. you got to pry that out of my dead, dead hands. So, um, it, I mean, we're always obviously working to make Python faster. It really depends. Um, it, it's, it's hard to do, right? Everyone's workload's different, and what seems fast, and everyone's needs are different. Like, what's fast to me is dead slow to like Google or someone who's like de hardcore, I gotta sh shave a millisecond off of every request that hits my web server because God forbid it take a more millisecond, which makes sense for some people but not for others. So no, there's no way in hell you're ever gonna do that just because there's always gonna be that speed nut who just can't give up that little bit. And that's fine, that's their decision if they wanna put the time in. But it, if they don't use, for instance, if they don't use CFFI, it's really unfortunate because it really locks them to see Python and say, giving them the, the healthy ecosystem of interpreters we have to actually use it. So I would suggest anyone who's about to write new wrappers do consider CFFI for that. Yeah? The Pogo thing, why is it just not by default? Is it bad on some platforms? Or well, confused about how it's okay, so Pogo, there, so, there's, so Pogo is available on uh, Windows through Visual Studio. And then it's also available through Clang and LLVM and also on GCC. Uh, Intel actually contributed the patches for our makefile. So I should say this, any of you who compile Python yourself, use the Pogo build, okay? Uh, it was added in 3.5 and in 2.7. Uh, make sure you build with it. Uh, Intel's benchmarked it, and as you saw here, 
There's basically no reason not to except for very explicit situations. Now you can obviously also use this to do your own benchmarking with your own workloads to make sure that your Pogo build is actually optimized specifically for your workload. Uh, but if you don't want to put that much effort in, I would st still do that. Now if you're on Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu has been doing this for years, so you're already getting it for free. Um, but if you do hand builds, you should definitely do this. Um, why, for instance, Steve hasn't turned it on by default? Uh, I, last time I brought this up, which I think was last week, uh, well, I, I mean, I was working on this literally until Thursday. So uh, we haven't got, sat down and talked about it. Maybe I'll talk about it t with him tonight. Um, there are still a couple cases where it doesn't perform better as, you, as I quickly breeze through because of time. There's like six benchmarks that's so a little slower. But I mean, some of them are like, 2% like, or 7% slower, nothing like, there's only like two or three that are double digit. Um, and Steve's not convinced that the test suite is the best workload to do for the uh, measurement build to measure before it does the POCO build to do the optimizations. Um, now I wanna challenge him to say, well, okay, what would you use instead? And I suspect he's gonna say, I don't know, in which case I'm gonna press him to say, well, then I say choose my option because I have one and you don't, I win, ha ha. But, I, I can't force Steve to choose that for the Windows builds. Um, Do you happen to know if Eugene uses that for the Conda build? Uh, no. Uh, are there any continue analytic employees in the room? I would ask their, I would ask their desk tomorrow. You could probably convince them. <laughs> Possibly. As I said, Ubuntu already does it. I'd be a little surprised if they don't already. Um, but yeah, I, it's a good question. I don't know. I think they should, though, if they don't. Uh, I don't know yet. Pigeon is obviously still in heavy development. I wouldn't even call it an alpha yet. Um, I'm so I don't know about that. Numba obviously is being written by Continuum, who obviously are NumPy experts, and it's designed to actually JIT NumPy stuff. So it'll actually JIT NumPy operations. Uh, PyPy obviously is still working on theirs. Uh, I know they've shown benchmarks where it's fast, but it's one of those they're not finished with their compatibility. Huh? Yeah, so it's one of those I don't know yet. Obviously, um, we hope with Pigeon, much like I'm sure with Numba, that if you're doing like straight integer or float work and we can detect that it doesn't, the, doesn't it, you need to box those numbers, you can just do it straight in the .NET um, bytecode and just do native float and int work. So we're, we, I mean, we're, those are like the first low hanging fruits we're gonna hit anyway. So we're hoping to get some decent numbers out of that. Yeah. Uh, Cython, you mean PyPy, Cython support PyPy? Uh, yeah. yes. I believe it does. Okay. I believe uh, the PyPy team worked with Cython in order to make sure that they got that support in. Because, uh, I mean, it's all auto-generated, right? So they just have to make sure they auto-generate in a way that PyPy can read it, so. Th this is one of the reasons why doing, using Cython or CFFI, and the whole reason they created CFFI to make it even easier was because as soon as it's auto-generated, it's just a, flip of something to make it just, I want that for PyPy or I want that for CPython, versus when you do it by hand, it's like you have no chance in hell of working with PyPy. Or anyone else, whoever decides to support it. Anyone else? Yep. So given that, do you know why the PyPy people decided to re-implement NumPy in our price instead of in Cython? Oh, why? Yeah. Uh, I think they, that project may have started before they got the Cython support. I, I don't know. The, 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 this, you'd have to ask the PyPy people. I'm not really involved with the project. I know the NumPyPy project has been around for a decent amount of time. So it's a question of I don't know the timeline. I don't know when did Cython get PyPy, when did CF, I know CFFI started after. And, I, and at this point, I don't know where it lies because once again, you have to realize sometimes PyPy is actually faster than C because that JIT is that good. Sometimes it actually beats out C code. So it's also one of those, if you want absolute fastest and they can pull off NumPy, Pi, it's possible it'll still be faster than Cython. But then again, it, it could potentially get the compatibility sooner. So I don't know. Ask the PyPy people. They're fairly responsive, actually. If you want to tweet at them, they'll probably give you an answer. Anyone else? All right, thanks, everybody.